Good morning, friends, and welcome again to Understanding Daniel. This is an in-depth study into the prophecies of the book of Daniel. It's actually a verse-by-verse study. I want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. If this is the first time you're joining us, you might want to find your Bible and open up to Daniel chapter 9 is where we'll be studying today. I want to welcome those who are joining us here in person, our regular church members, also our online members, and our visitors who are joining us this morning. A very exciting and important study. We're going to be looking at the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. It goes along with the 2300-year prophecy of Daniel 8.14. We're going to see how the two time prophecies connect together this morning. But before we get to our study, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we are so grateful that we have this chance to be able to gather together in your house to worship you on your special day. We thank you for your word. Indeed, it is a light unto our path that guides us into a clear understanding of where we are in the stream of time and your will for our lives. Lord, we thank you for this this great prophecy that we find in Daniel. So guide us in our study. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 9. We've looked at the first 20 verses, 19 verses so far. And you'll recall Daniel chapter 8 ends with a time prophecy. Daniel 8, 14 says, Under 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. The angel comes and explains the meaning of the symbols of Daniel chapter 8. He ends by saying, and the vision of the evenings and the mornings is true. Then we find Daniel, he's sort of overwhelmed by this revelation from the angel Gabriel. He faints. Some time goes on, and then we're nearing the end of the seven-year prophecy, and Daniel was studying the writings of Jeremiah, and he understood that the Babylonian captivity was to be 70 years. They were reaching the end of that time period. And so Daniel set himself to earnest prayer, fasting, seeking for clear understanding of these prophecies, in particular the 2300 days, which wasn't fully explained, as well as how does that relate to the 70-year prophecy, or the 70-week prophecy, I should say, of Daniel, uh, or this Babylonian captivity. How do these prophecies fit together? So the first half of Daniel chapter 9, you have Daniel praying, and he's interceding on behalf of his people, and the angel Gabriel comes in response to that prayer. That's where we're picking up our study today. So in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to start reading in verse 20. It says, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Notice the two things that Daniel is highlighting in his prayer. He's praying for his people. He's also praying for, talks about the holy mountain of my God. That is Jerusalem. Now, you'll recall in 605 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, the Jews were taken captive. And here we're reaching the end of that time period, and Daniel is wanting the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. He's wanting the Jews to go back to their homeland, back to their city. All right, look at the note there under verse 20. Daniel's heart was heavy with concern for the people of God, the devastated city, and the temple. His foremost desire was for God's honor and the well-being of Israel which motivated him to approach God through prayer, fasting, and profound humility. Just as God listened to Daniel's supplication, he will also hear our petitions when we come to him in faith with humble hearts. We read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, these are the words of Jesus, Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now there is context to this verse. This is not praying and asking for, you know, earthly things or things that, you know, we might just desire or want that's contrary to God's will. We've got to pray in harmony with his will. But the broader context of this is praying for spiritual things. A little earlier, Jesus said, if you've been evil, now to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So this is in the context of asking for the Holy Spirit and asking for a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we understand there is to be a special outpouring of the Spirit before the end of time. So we ought to be praying like Daniel did, asking God to reveal Himself, to give us His Spirit in an extra special measure to do the work He's called us to do. Verse 21, Daniel 9, 21. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So finally, in response to Daniel's prayer, the man Gabriel. Now it says there, the man Gabriel, but we know he's an angel because it says he flew swiftly to Daniel. 
So he appears in the form of a man, but it is the angel Gabriel that he had seen earlier in the previous vision. Look at the note. In response to Daniel's prayer, Gabriel, the very same angelic being who had previously explained the first part of the vision of chapter 8, returns now to finish his appointed task to make Daniel understand the vision. Now let me just read a few passages here from Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 8 verse 15. This is going back to the previous vision. It says, Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly, this is Daniel 8 15, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uliers say, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So after Daniel saw the vision of the ram and the goat and the horn power that would persecute God's people, the 2300 days, the angel Gabriel then is commissioned to help Daniel understand the vision. So the angel does that. He explains who the ram is. He explains who the goat is, who the first horn is, representing Alexander the Great, the first king. He talks about the other power, the Roman power that would arise. Rome, both in its pagan phase as well as its papal phase. And he briefly mentions the 2300 days, but he doesn't get into details. So now Gabriel appears again to finish up the explanation of Daniel chapter 8. All right, so let me keep reading here. Middle of the paragraph there in the summary, it says, The vision at the beginning refers to the vision of chapter 8, which the angel did not complete because Daniel fainted and was sick for certain, day, certain days. And even though he received, sorry, and even though he recovered and went about the king's business, it says he was astonished by the vision and nobody understood it. Daniel chapter 8, verse 26 says, Gabriel is now speaking, and he says, And the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Verse 27, Daniel 8, 27, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterwards I rose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Now that's an important verse. This is the end of chapter 8. Now the angel Gabriel explained who the ram is who the goat is, what the horns represent. Matter of fact, the angel Gabriel actually said, the ram represents the kings of Medo-Persia. The goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the notable horn between its eyes represents its first king. There's no doubt as to what those symbols represent. But the evenings and the mornings, the 2300-day prophecy, is what Daniel did not understand. And he asked about it. He spoke to maybe some of his friends, but they didn't understand it. He was astonished. All right, and the angel is coming back now to explain the meaning of this. All right, me, going back to the notes there, near the end, beginning with the word, this lack of understanding. All right, there we are. This lack of understanding caused Daniel to study the writings of Jeremiah, which indicated that the Jewish captivity would be 70 years. But how did this connect with the 2300 days which he had seen in the vision? Daniel 8, 14, unto 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So that's the big question in Daniel's mind. What about this 2,300-year time period? Why is that a question? Well, Daniel understood that the promises of God, the prophecies of God, were conditional, many of them. Conditional upon God's people doing something. He knew that the Jews would be in captivity for 70 years, but now he heard about 2,300 years. Does that mean God changed his mind because of the sins of Israel? They weren't allowed to go back after 70 years? Was it an extended period of time? And that's a very long period. So this was part of the reason why Daniel was confused and he wanted further understanding. We have a hand right there. Yes. Good morning, Pastor. Oops. Am I on? The, you, you are on, yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Pastor. The, um, this last sentence in the note, uh, it, for the first 20 verses of Daniel 9, he's not worried about the 2300-day prophecy at all. He wants to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and then rebuild the city. So I'm not, I don't understand how you can make this leap from Jerusalem back to the 2300 days, which Gabriel had said, put it away. Don't think about it anymore. It's for the future. Okay, good question. Well, if you finish up in chapter 8, remember Daniel's worried about the 2300 days. The angel does not give him a clear explanation of that. In Daniel 9, he is praying for his people, for the temple, for the reconstruction of the temple. What does that have to do with the 2300 days? Well, the 2300 days of Daniel 8, 14 says, Under 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. But in order for the sanctuary to be cleansed, the sanctuary needs to be built. And the cleansing of the sanctuary would have something to do with once the sanctuary is finished, then you would cleanse the sanctuary to begin its services. 
So in Daniel's mind, if he's thinking about the sanctuary in Jerusalem, if it's not going to be cleansed until 2,300 years, does that mean the temple's not going to be built for 2,300 years? You see the confusion in his mind, and that's why the angel is coming out to explain it. And you'll see how this comes together quite beautifully. Yes, another hand. We'll let the microphone hold on. We'll get you a microphone. Keep your hand raised until you get a microphone. Here it comes. Okay. All right, we'll come back to that one. Let's keep moving then. We've got three points that will tie this together here, talking about the 2,300 days and the 70 weeks. We'll give you a minute just to get set up, and then we'll let you ask a question. Let me read verse 22, and then we'll take the question. And he informed me, and he talked with me, and he said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill in understanding. Now, notice the wording of Gabriel. Gabriel says, I've come to give you skill in understanding. What was it? that Daniel needed understanding in. If you read the first part of chapter 9, Daniel is praying on behalf of his people. He's confessing their sins. There's no skill in understanding necessary for that part of the chapter. But the angel Gabriel knows what is really troubling Daniel. How does the 2300 days relate to the 70 years? Now the angel says, I'm going to come and explain it to you. I'm giving you understanding. Yes, question. Well, in the end of chapter 8, Daniel faints. Was not. So the angel can't finish his explanation, right? right? He's so overwhelmed. It was a pretty emotional issue for Daniel. Yes. And he needed to have clarity of what to do with all these dates, just like we do. We That's come right. to the same spot that Daniel does. That's right. And we don't faint as a general rule <laughs> because my heart isn't exactly enclosed in the rebuilding of Jerusalem because it's already been done. Well, our focus is now a heavenly Jerusalem, yeah. right? A heavenly yeah. temple, not an earthly temple. And of course, Daniel was concerned about an earthly temple because that probationary time period had not yet ended for the Jews. And we'll get to that. All right, let me read the note under verse 22. There is a close connection between the 2300 days, the vision of Daniel chapter 8, and the explanation given by the angel in chapter 9. There are three reasons why we say these two visions are connected. First one is all of the symbols of a vision of chapter 8 are fully explained except the 2300 days. Daniel 8.26, Gabriel mentions the time element but explains his explanation is cut short before a clear explanation can be given. Why is his explanation cut short? Well, it says Daniel fainted. He was overwhelmed. Second point, Daniel knew that the 70 years of the Jewish captivity foretold by the prophet Jeremiah were, were nearly at an end, according to Jeremiah 25, 11. But he feared that an extension of their captivity might occur because of Israel's lack of sincere repentance. He thus interceded most earnestly with God for the return of the Jews and the restoration of the now desolate sanctuary in Jerusalem. And of course, you can read that in Daniel chapter 9, the first three verses. Point number three, why the 2300 is connected to this passage. In answer to his prayer, Gabriel, who had been commissioned to explain the vision of chapter 8, same angel, greeted Daniel with the announcement, I am now come forth to give you skill in understanding. Daniel was told to understand the matter and consider the vision in verse 23. So the angel Gabriel, let me just say something about this. The angel Gabriel comes and says, I'm, I've now come to give you skill in understanding. Then he says, consider the vision. So he's actually telling Daniel what he needs to think about with reference to the explanation. Consider the vision, he says. That is the vision at the beginning, verse 21. This can only refer to that of chapter 8, as no other vision had been given in the interim. So three good reasons why Gabriel's explanation in Daniel 9 is connected to the 2300 days. Let me read the last paragraph there. In the context, the context makes it clear that the explanation provided in Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is a continuation of the explanation that began in chapters 8, 15 to 26. The subject matter is identical and deals with the explained, unexplained portion of the vision, which would be the 2300 days. Verse 23. Here we're getting into it. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I am come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. It's interesting the words. He says, you are greatly beloved. Here, Daniel is petitioning, interceding on behalf of his people. He's concerned about temple and about the destruction of Jerusalem and he's wondering if his prayer is even be, being heard and the angel comes and says yes Daniel you are greatly beloved your prayers are not in vain 
Sometimes we might even feel, we've got a hand right here, sometimes we might feel that our prayers are not being heard and we say, Lord, where are you? But the message to Daniel is a message to us. God loves us. You are greatly beloved. Trust in the Lord. Stay faithful. Keep praying. God will answer it in the right time. Question right up here. Yes, the word skill. I'm still kind of thrown by that. What exactly is the skill? I've, given, I've come to give you skill in understanding. Now, when it talks about skill, it required, when we get into the actual time prophecy, there's a little bit of math involved. There is some calculating that needs to be done. And the angel is explaining to Daniel how he's going to do this. So the skill there refers to there's, there's some little thinking you have to do. Okay. Coming to help you think through this, in other words, all right? All right, let's read that paragraph under there. It says, in the last words to Daniel during his previous visit, visit Gabriel stated that the vision concerning the 2,300 days was true. That's verse 26 of chapter 8. In Daniel 9.24, he begins his explanation where he previously left off the 2,300 days. Not only does Gabriel give a starting point for the 2,300 days of chapter 8, verse 14, but he also reveals one of the most significant time prophecies in Scripture. This prophecy foretold the time of Christ's baptism, his crucifixion, and when the gospel would go to the Gentile world. It has been called the keystone of Old Testament prophecies because it locks all others securely into place. The Bible contains many amazing prophecies, but none is more important than this one. This is a great prophecy. We'll see. So here we start, verse 24. You ready? Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and for your holy city. Pause right there. Seventy weeks are for your people and your city. Now, who is the your people? Gabriel is speaking to Daniel, and Daniel obviously is a Jew. So when he says for your people, he's referring to Israel. No mystery there, right? He's referring to Israel. And when he says your holy city, what is the holy city? Jerusalem. What was the condition of Jerusalem when Gabriel was talking to Daniel? It was in ruins. Now, the holy city is referred to holy because of the temple. And what makes the temple holy is the Shekinah presence of God that was revealed in the Old Testament. Now, after the rebuilding of the temple, after the 70 years, the Ark of the Covenant was never placed in the most holy place. It was in hiding. But still, the temple was where God would reveal himself to his people. It was considered holy. The temple was holy. Jerusalem, being the city where the temple was, was considered the holy city. So 70 weeks, according to this time period here, is for the Jews, that's their probationary time period, and for their city, Jerusalem. Now these are prophetic 70 weeks, as we'll get to. There are certain things that are to take place during this time period, during this probationary time period that was given to the Jews. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, that's an important one, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So a number of very important things were to take place during the 70 weeks, or at the ending of this time period. Well, let's take a closer look. Look at the note there. Gabriel begins by stating that the 70 weeks were to be determined for Daniel's people. Daniel's people is the Jews. The Hebrew word determined means to cut off or measure off. This cutting off must be from some longer period of time, and the only such period referred to in the vision, Daniel chapter 8, is the 2300 days or years, which means that the two time periods must have the same starting point. Three times in Daniel 8, it is stated that the prophecy would reach into the distant future. Thus, the 70 weeks and the 2300 days must be interpreted as prophetic time and not literal time. And of course, you can see that in Daniel 8, 17 and 19, 26. Remember that one prophetic day is equal to one literal year. Thus, 70 weeks would be 70 times 7. That would be 490 literal years. And the 2300 days would be 2300 literal years. So when Gabriel said 70 weeks of probationary time is given for the Jews and their city, it's referring to 490 literal years. Now, we have the time period, 490 years, but we don't know when it begins. Gabriel will tell us when it begins. 
But the beginning of the 490 years is cut off from a much longer period of time. So the longer period of time is the 2300 years. The first 490 years or the 2300 years is cut off and given for the Jews. That's their probationary time. And within that 490 years, a number of things would have to take place as it relates to the Jewish people. It talks about their city, it talks about the sanctuary, it talks about bringing in righteousness, it talks about anointing the most holy. These are important things. All right, well, let me keep going here and then we'll get to the question. Next phrase that we have there, it says, the phrase to make reconciliation for iniquity is a reference to when Jesus would bring an end to the sacrificial system by his vicarious sacrifice on the cross. Through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus has made everlasting righteousness accessible to every person with sincere, who, with sincere faith, accepts it. John chapter 1, verse 29, speaking of Jesus, John the Baptist said, The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that does what? Takes away the sins of the world. That is to make reconciliation for iniquity. What about to seal up the vision and the prophecy? This is a reference to the confirming or the ratifying of the prophecy by the first coming of the Messiah, which assured the other features of the prophecy, notably the 2300 days, would also be fulfilled in their right time. To seal up the vision. What about to anoint the most holy? What does that mean? That signifies the commencement of Christ's high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary after his ascension. Before the inauguration of the earthly sanctuary, both the holy place and the most holy place, along with its furnishings, were anointed. So we're still talking about the 490 years of probationary time given to the Jews. Within that 490-year time period, the Messiah would come, he would provide a sacrifice for sins, and he would also begin his high priestly ministry in another sanctuary, and it talks about the anointing of that sanctuary. Before the priest would begin his work, in a sanctuary, it would first need to be anointed. Jesus, after his ascension, he began his high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. That sanctuary had to also be anointed. Look in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 10, 11. It's in your notes here. It says, Also Moses took the anointing oil, and he anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, and consecrated them. He sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times. The altar, he anointed the altar and all of its utensils, the laver and its base, to consecrate them. So before the priest began his work in the earthly sanctuary, it had to be anointed. Now if you look in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, you read about Christ's heavenly ministry. Verse 23, Hebrews 9, 23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which is a copy of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Paul is saying in Hebrews that the earthly sanctuary and the anointing of the sanctuary there at the time of Moses was a type of what Jesus would do as our high priest when he ascended to heaven and he begins his high priestly ministry. So within that 490-year time period of probation given to the Jews, not only would the Messiah come, not only would he provide a sacrifice for sins, but he would also begin his high priestly ministry within that 490-year time period. There's a lot in this prophecy. Yes, so a hand. Yes, Pastor, the, regarding the coincidence of the 490-year and the 2300-day prophecies, the, to, to cut out, that could also be interpreted to mean can just come out, to be cut out from the flow of time and have nothing to do with the 2300 days. Would you, would you, would you grant that that's also a, a perfectly valid interpretation? Well, it could be a suggestion, but I don't think it's consistent with the context. For example, if you're going to cut something off, it would imply that you would cut it off something else. If I'm building a house and I have a two by four and I cut off a certain portion, it would imply that I'm cutting it off something larger. Otherwise, why separate it from something else? So the fact that it says 490 years are determined or cut off for your people that time period is cut off from a larger time period. Well, where do we go to find the larger time period? Well, we have to go back to the prophecy itself. And we don't have to go very far to find a longer time period. Just go back one chapter, the very end, 2,300 years. So if 490 years is cut off from something, where do we find that something that it's cut off from? 
the 2300 years. So let the Bible interpret itself. Don't, don't give room for private interpretation. We have to back up what the Bible says by the Bible. Keep your hand raised, we'll get you a microphone. Okay, so that's the 70 weeks. I'm going to read verse 25 and then we're going to take the question. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Oh, this is exciting. We got the starting point. The starting point of the 490 years. The starting point of the 2300 days. Question, yes. Why do they put... Keep your mic up nice and close. Why is the last week part of this premillennial dispensationalism and oh, they had okay. it at the end yes. and some Christian faiths do this. I think majority do, but we don't. Okay, we're going to get to that. Why, why is the last week of the 70 weeks cut off and placed at a future event after the Antichrist appears, after the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem? We're going to talk about that. We'll get to that in just a minute. All right? Good question. So look at verse 25. When does the 490 years begin? When do the 2300 years begin? If the 490 is cut off of the 2300, we've got to have a starting point. Here is the starting point. The angel says, know therefore and understand. In other words, you've got to think about it. All right? Here it is. Here's the explanation. Understand. From the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem, where were the Jews at the time when the angel said this? They were captives in Babylon. Of course, Babylon had fallen. The Persians were now in control. And there was a decree that would allow the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple and the city. The first decree by Cyrus allowed the Jews to go back and start rebuilding the temple. There was a second decree by Darius because the construction of the temple had been halted because of some problems from the Samaritans. But it's the third decree, the decree of Artaxerxes, that allowed the Jews to go back and finish the temple but also rebuild the city of Jerusalem and to have their own government in place. So that's the most important decree. That's the decree that allows them to go and rebuild Jerusalem, all right? So let's look at the note. The command to rebuild Jerusalem, which followed the Babylonian Persian captivity, involved three significant decrees by Persian kings. That's the first one. The first was by Cyrus in 538 BC and primarily focused on the rebuilding of the temple. And you can read about that in Ezra chapter 1. The second decree is by Darius in 519 BC. Notice that we're counting down because we're in BC time. So it's going down. 519, this essentially reaffirmed the earlier edict because of disruptions in the construction, the reconstruction of the temple due to enemy attacks. We're going to talk more about that in chapter 10. And then the third decree is the most important one for us. The third and most important decree was issued by Artaxerxes in the year 457 BC, which promoted the reestablishment of worship in Jerusalem and also provided for the reconstruction of the Jewish state with full powers of local government. The text of this royal decree, which came into effect in the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign, can be found in Ezra chapter 7, 11 through 26. So which of the decrees fulfills what the angel says? That's the third decree, to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. That is 457 BC. So that is our starting point both for the 490 and the 2300 days. All right, I'm going to keep going a little bit, and then we'll get to your, your question here in just a minute. All right, next point that we have. The starting point then of the prophecy, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, was not fully met until the comprehensive decree of Artaxerxes in the autumn of 457 BC. Thus, 457 BC is established as the starting point of both the 70 weeks or the 490 years and the 2300 days or years of Daniel 8.14. By the end of the first seven weeks, or 49 years, that's 48 BC, work had advanced to the stage where the ruined city began to take shape and the wall around the city was completed. Now, I want you to notice in the verse itself, look at verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So the 490-year time period is divided up into three shorter time periods. The first is seven weeks or 49 years. Then there's 62 weeks, and then there's one week. What happened after that first seven weeks or 49 years? That's when the wall around Jerusalem was finally complete. 
That's why that specific time period is mentioned, all right? And that was in 408 BC. That's 49 years after the decree in 457 was given. So we can see how closely prophecy is lining up with what actually happened, with the history that took place here. Then it talks about Messiah the Prince. The Messiah the Prince, of course, is Jesus. The word Messiah means the Christ or the Anointed One. And it refers to Jesus when he was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism in 27 AD. Now notice the following points that we have. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit when he began his public ministry. And let me read you a few verses here. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So when did Jesus, when was Jesus anointed in a special sense with the Holy Spirit? Well, it says immediately after that, he went about doing good and healing. That's the beginning of his public ministry. And of course, when Jesus came up after being baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit descended upon Christ in the form of a dove, and a voice was heard from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 says, this anointing took place at his baptism, it says, when he was baptized, Jesus came up out of the water, and behold, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and alighting upon him. And then enlightened followers from that point onwards referred to Jesus as the Messiah. John chapter 1, verse 40, one of the two who heard John speaking and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. So Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, and Andrew are there. They were John's disciples. They follow Jesus. Then Andrew went and found his brother Peter and said, we have found the Christ. We found the Messiah. And Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. So they recognized that Jesus there's something special about Jesus. He is anointed. He is the Christ. We've got a hand right here. We'll bring the mic down here and there. Question over there. Yes. Yeah, regarding uh, Daniel 8, it's quite clear, <coughs> pardon me, that um, the 2300-day prophecy begins with this little horn that arises out of one of the four partitions of Alexander's empire and it destroys a temple, desecrating the, t the, the sanctuary. So, which temple in 457 BC is being, is just being destroyed by this little horn? And if, and if there is none, then can't we discount this or just disregard this 457 date? No, we can't disregard the 457 date. Why? Because it fits the prophecy. Now, let me talk about that real quick. We spoke about it in Daniel chapter 8, but Antiochus Epiphanes is not the little horn power described in Daniel 8. Several reasons. Number one, 2300 days, if you take it literal, is six and a half years. It has no bearing on Antiochus Epiphanes. It is true that Antiochus, which was one of the kings in the divided Grecian Empire, he did have some issues with the Jews, and he marched into Jerusalem and to shut down some sort of revolt, he sacrificed a pig on the altar. That's a great insult. He even forced the priest to eat some of the swine's flesh, which you could really understand didn't go down well. That resulted in a great revolt amongst the Jews. But the temple still continued. It was not destroyed during that time. So the little on power that destroys the temple has to be Rome because Rome destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Antioch, Antioch Epiphany didn't, all right? He just harassed the Jews. And there were many various kings that caused problems for the Jews after the, the Jews went back to Jerusalem. Well, let's keep going because we'll probably touch on some of these things. Yes, question. So how old was Jesus at his baptism and at what age was he allowed, or was priests allowed to go to the people? To begin their work. Yeah. Jesus was 30 years old when he was baptized and he began his public ministry. Uh, to be a priest, you had to be at least 30. It was, you had to have some degree of experience. So Christ began his public ministry at 30. That means he was born somewhere around 3 or 4 B.C., now, you might be wondering, wait a minute, was Christ born before Christ was born? <laughs> well, the A.D. B.C. dating system came many years later. And in their calculations, they were off just slightly. Christ is baptized in 27 A.D., and he's baptized when he's 30. 
So that means he must have been born somewhere around 4 B.C., 3 or 4 B.C. So the cru crucifixion was about... 31. 30, 30, 31 he was 31. AD. Yes, 31 A.D. Stoney or Stephen, he's 34 A.D. But Jesus, him, but Jesus himself was about 33. Jesus began his ministry at 30. 30. He was crucified at 33. Yeah. Okay. Roughly in that time period. Okay, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get into this. All right, still talking about the anointing of Messiah the Prince. I told you this was going to be fun. Isn't this neat? Looking at these prophecies, I just love it. All right, point number four. Talking about the anointing of Messiah the Prince. Jesus bore public witness to his own anointing by the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 4. This is a great story. Jesus goes to Nazareth. It's the Sabbath. That's the town that he grew up in. And he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they gave him the scroll of Isaiah. And he was to read from it. And so Jesus opened up the scroll. And this is what he did. Verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Oh, that's the anointing of the Messiah. Jesus knew this. This is right after his baptism. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Talking about time here. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and the eyes of all of those in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> Beautiful passage. All right, so Jesus recognized that his baptism marked the beginning of his public ministry. He began preaching and teaching and healing. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. All right, then it talks about after the 62 weeks, this is verse 26, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, until the end war and desolations are determined. Now, let me say something about the structure of Hebrew poetry, because this helps us understand the next few verses in particular. There's, there's a structure called chiasm, or the chiastic structure that we find in a number of Hebrew passages, especially in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, we find chiastic structure in the book of Revelation, Isaiah, chiastic structure. And basically what this means is that there are two subjects that are being expounded upon or introduced, sometimes three, even four, depending upon how big the chiastic structure is. And you'd have subject A followed by subject B. And then you'd have subject B and then subject A. So it's almost like a pyramid. You have subject A introduced, and then a totally different subject, subject B, and then you'd have another comment, but it would go back to subject B, and then a fourth comment that would tie in with subject A. So it's almost like a pyramid. The reason for that is it would draw your attention to the central theme of that chiastic structure, or what you really, really important. In verse 26, we have a chiastic structure, and here's where it is. You'll see it. Beginning verse 26 again, it says, And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's subject A. What is subject A about? It's about Jesus. He's the Messiah. It's talking about him being cut off, meaning his sacrificial death. That's subject A. But now we go to subject B. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? It was the Romans under Titus. So Titus is the prince right? That's subject B. And it says, till the end, war and desolations are determined. There are two subjects that have been addressed in these verses. The one is Christ, the Messiah, and the other is the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember at the beginning of the explanation that's given by Gabriel, he says, 70 weeks are for your people and for their city. So we're talking about the people, the Jewish people, we're talking about the Messiah coming, and we're talking about Jerusalem, the city and the temple, and when its destruction would come. So those are the two subjects, subject A and subject B that's been addressed in these passages. All right, let me look at the note under that. The Messiah was to be cut off but not for himself. After a brief public ministry of only three and a half years, in 31 AD, Jesus was crucified. The extraordinary tearing of the temple veil at the moment of Christ's death marked the end of the Old Testament sanctuary services and further validated the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. In Matthew 26, 50, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. 
Then behold, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks split. Who tore, who tore that veil in the temple when Jesus died? It was God, because it says specifically the veil was torn from top to bottom. An angel tore the veil. What did that mean? The Old Testament sacrificial system had come to an end. Why? Because the true Lamb of God had been slain. So the focus now is no longer on an earthly sanctuary. Don't miss that. Our focus is not on an earthly sanctuary. If a temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem, our focus is not on an earthly temple rebuilt in Jerusalem, if ever it is rebuilt. Where is to be our focus? On the heavenly New Jerusalem and the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus, our high priest, is now. That's the focus. Not an earthly sanctuary because the veil was rent. Remember when Jesus walked out of the temple for the last time just before his crucifixion? He said, your house is left to you desolate. The temple has no longer any meaning. The true temple is the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers for us. Okay. Who are the people of the prince? This refers to the Roman soldiers under the leadership of Titus who in 70 AD laid siege to Jerusalem. According to contemporary historian Josephus, the Roman army broke through the first two walls of the city, but a stubborn standoff prevented them from penetrating the third wall. But finally, five months later, the Roman forces overwhelmed all Jewish resistance, set fire to the temple, and destroyed the city. The war took a major toll on human life, with most of the Jews in the city being killed, and the rest were taken captive back to Rome. Now, there were a few prophecies that Jesus gave concerning this. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 1 and 2. Let me read this. Matthew 24. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Verse 2. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say unto you, Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus, referring to the temple, he said, Every stone is going to be thrown down. Judgment is coming upon this temple. Luke chapter 23, verse 28. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Here is the scene. Jesus is now bearing his cross, and he's going to Calvary. And there were some women that were weeping because they were seeing what the Romans were doing to Jesus. By this time, Christ had been beaten. He was bleeding. He was bearing his cross. He had a crown of thorns pressed upon his head. And he's dragging this heavy cross, and the women are weeping. And Jesus turns to them, and he says, don't weep for me. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Then he said, for indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then Jesus says, then they will begin to say, mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. Verse 31. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Now that's sort of an interesting statement. What does Jesus mean when he says, if they do these things in the green tree or the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Who is the they that Jesus is referring to? He's referring to the Romans, right? That's why the women were weeping, because of what the Romans were doing. Jesus said, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. Because if the Romans will do this in the green tree, what will be done in the dry? What is the green tree? What does the tree represent in the Bible? Israel was represented as a tree, a tree planted by the Lord, right? An olive tree. And a green tree still has life. It's still under probation. But a dry tree has death. Probation is closed. In essence, Jesus is saying, if the Romans will do this while probation time is still extended for the Jews, what's going to happen to the Jews after probation closes? Well, we know what the Romans did to the Jews after probation closed. You have 70 AD, when the Romans came and destroyed the city and the temple, and the slaughter was great. Many Jews were put to death. The rest were taken slaves. The temple was never rebuilt. It is still not built today. So that's what Jesus is referring to here when he says, if they do this in the greenwood, what will they do in the dry? I'm going to have to keep going because I want to get through to a couple of points. Luke 21, beginning verse 20. This verse is in your notes. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart. 
And let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he says it is a fulfillment of prophecy. These things would take place. Verse 27. Verse 27. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, we started with the 490 years of the 70 weeks. Of the 70 weeks, the first week was for the rebuilding of the wall of the temple, of, of the city of Jerusalem, right? 49 years, the walls rebuilt. Then you have another 62 weeks. That brings you to a total of 69 weeks. What was to happen at the end of the 69 weeks? The Messiah was to be anointed. Jesus was baptized, and he began his public ministry. That leaves one more week, that last seven-year time period. So if Jesus was baptized in 27 AD, and he began his public ministry, and seven years from that, that would be 34 AD. So now we're talking about this last week, these last seven years of the, of the 70 week prophecy. It says he, that's Jesus, that's subject A. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Jesus confirmed the covenant with the Jews for seven years after he began his public ministry. Three and a half years in person and three and a half years through his apostles. I'm going to look at some verses that make this very clear. But in the middle of the week, that's three and a half years after his baptism, he, Christ, will bring an end to sacrifices and offerings. How does Jesus bring an end to sacrifice and offerings three and a half years after his public ministry began? He died on the cross. It's so clear. It's talking about Jesus. Now that's subject A. Now we're going to go to subject B. And remember, what was subject B? Destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, okay? The next part of the verse is destruction of Jerusalem. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. It's basically talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So he's talking about Jesus, subject A. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then in this verse, Jesus, three and a half years, puts an end to sacrifice, but then sometime after that, Rome comes and destroys the temple. That's subject B. All right, let me read the note on that, and then we might be running out of time. We'll have to keep going next week. For three and a half years of his public ministry, Jesus confirmed the covenant in person before his crucifixion. Then for another three and a half years after his resurrection, he confirmed it by his apostles, making a total of seven years or one prophetic week. Now we have a number of verses here, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, we're just going to look at that. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Notice what Paul says. This covenant was first spoken of by the Lord, three and a half years, and then by those who heard him, that would be the apostles, for the other three and a half years, making the total of the seven-year time period. The phrase in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings, is again a reference to the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross in 31 AD. The stoning of Stephen in 34 AD denoted the end of that probationary time period that God had given to the nation of Israel and marked the official rejection of the gospel by the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem. Significantly, Saul, that same year is converted to Paul, was converted shortly after the stoning of Stephen and became the leading apostle to the Gentiles for the proclamation of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 9. So in 34 AD, at the stoning of Stephen, that marked the end of that 70 weeks or that 490 years of probationary time period that God had given to the Jewish people. Now, of course, as this probationary time period was nearing its end, you have Jesus who weeps over Jerusalem and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and those that are sent to you, how I have longed to gather you together, even as a hen gathers the chicks under her wings, but you would not. They rejected their Messiah. And when they rejected their Messiah, they rejected God's protection. And when you reject God's protection, then you're opening yourself up to the enemy. And the enemy of the Jews was the Romans. And we saw what they did when God withdrew his protection in 70 AD. That's the abomination of desolation that Jesus referred to, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. 
the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. Well, there's a whole lot more to go, but we're running out of time. So we're going to keep studying Daniel chapter 9 and getting into our time prophecies even a little bit more next week. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are so grateful that we have this opportunity to study these exciting prophecies that point to Jesus, our Messiah, the one who died so that we might be forgiven and cleansed. And Lord, we thank you for your word. It is indeed a light to guide us, to help strengthen our faith in you and in your word and prophecies. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for joining us here at the Granite Bay Church. We're going to be taking a short little break, and then we'll continue with our worship service. God.